Uh, look, just to start off, tell us about the, the music scene in Edinburgh in those very early days for you. Was it a, a strong music scene? Uh, there was. I, I, I played in uh, a, a bunch of little bands that, you know, I met people at school and we had little kind of, uh, uh, like kind of clones of other bands, you know, like a Holly type group, groups like the Hollies and a group, you know, different different kind of um, beat group invitations, that kind of stuff. Mm. And uh, so I played in that and, and then I stumbled into the folk scene, which was pretty thriving. There was this uh, place in Edinburgh. Uh, called the Crown Bar, which was actually run by Archie Fisher. They used it on a Tuesday night for a kind of, and and all the artists would just go along there and they'd share the money at the door, which was not yet, which kind of was quite good for the day, yeah. <laughs> for, for the time. And um, of course, the bar liked it because they sold a lot of beer. And Archie kind of, kind of ran it, but uh, Robert and Clive were in there right from the beginning, and uh, and Bert Jans and uh, who else was in there? Um, I, I, a couple of people right from the early days. Yeah, Hamish Imlach, and uh, you probably don't know him, and a, a few other uh, people of that time. And later on, it expanded, and you got the, uh, you know, um, various other people that you would know. David Graham was in pretty early. Yeah. So, so that was where you met met Robert and Clive for the first time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was playing with Robert, but I went on Tuesday night as a kind of audience member and and watched this thing. And they, they had a lot of the Irish people, you know. Uh, but Archie had a lot of friends on the folk scene. He, he, at that time, he ran the Travelling Folk, which was a Radio Scotland folk programme, which was very good, uh, weekly. And that gave everyone a lot of exposure. Anyone who was doing concerts or had a record uh, would want to be on there. So we got a lot of people. So was there a um, an initial blueprint for the, the sound you wanted for the Incredible String Band? Well, at that point, um, the... the, the the point of crossover was when Robin and Clive uh, saw me in the audience there. They knew that I played guitar, and they, they because they did solo instruments, you know, Clive did like banjo and whistle, and Robin did like, all kinds of stuff, you know. But but they wanted someone to strum, and, and form, you know, so that, that's why they wanted to form a trio, really, so they could have because the two of them were more uh, soloists, you know, and they, and they wanted someone just to hold it down while they did stuff. And so uh, they had auditions for somebody to join, and I, I was not the first choice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but the first choice uh, turned it down because he thought know, they were just a bit too weird. <laughs> so, so I, so I got in by default, and they said, and so, so uh, we all went round to Robin's flat and played together, and they kind of liked the the combination. You know? mm. So that was how we thought. <laughs> So, looking through the catalogue of the band, can you pinpoint an album or, or a time where it, it really gelled together and became the band that, that, that you wanted it to be? Sure, well, the, with the first album, uh, the stream band, that's, that's what we, when, when we formed together, the three of us, we just toured around all the clubs, all the folk clubs, and it was very popular because they'd been very popular, but the audience just stayed about the same at the Crown Bar, you know, it never really got mobbed or anything. So, when we went on road, it was very successful. And because uh, and the, the folk clubs were used to people doing like uh, uh, you know the, you know the kind of repertoire at that time that was kind of John Byers songs on your own and things you know it was it was and we were rather different to that it was I guess it was more like a drug band sound which mm. was not really heard of over here in America it probably wouldn't have made much of a splash but uh, here here it was very popular so the first album is a representation of that really that's the that's the act what we're doing. Mm. Uh, but when we got into the studio to make the first album, it, it, Jack Holtzman, of course, in America, was not really that interested in us doing covers of uh, jug band songs or, you know, like a, a classic kind of folk stuff from America because he could get that by, by the million. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, he encouraged me and Robin to write, and I had a few songs already I'd written, and Robin uh, did, did a couple for the album, and Clive had one, he, he, which was Empty Bucket Blues. <laughs> so, he did that, but really, really, Joe pushed us, because of Jack, I think, because of what he wanted, Joe, Joe pushed us in the studio to do uh, more original material. And that's, uh, they can kind of slot in a bit, but in the middle of it also, you've got Clyde banjo stuff, and it's pretty much the act we were taking around, that one. Yeah. Now, Joe Boyd was both your manager and producer, and in general terms, how did you find him to work with? What, qual what qualities did he bring to the table? Uh, well, well, to start off with, he, came, he was a skunk for Electro. Like, well, that's what he said he was, actually. But it, also, have you read the, the book at all by him? It's really quite interesting. 
Uh, no, I haven't. No, but I believe it is a wonderful read, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting look, yeah, because um, basically he was employed by Jack Holtzman at Electra to come over here and promote the people they had, like Tom Rush and Judy Collins, you know, that would, hadn't really made their mark over here. So that was the job he was given. But he turned that job into it being a bit of a, a producer. He never really produced records, I don't think, before he did the, the Pink Floyd single. Um, uh, C. Emily Play. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Arnold Blaine. Uh, that, that's kind of a, a double single. And he was hoped through that that he would get to produce their first album, but they went to somebody else. And he, he didn't get that, so that fell through. So he kind of, uh, without actually saying in so many words, he presented himself as a kind of American producer who'd been sent by Jack Holtzman to scout for talent, which he hadn't really been. But he didn't say it in so many words, but he came up to Scotland and introduced himself, and we, we played the repertoire, and then we went down to, and recorded it. So he, he was right in there from the beginning, really, from the beginning of the string band, certainly. Now, your second album, the, the, the 5,000 Spirits album, received incredible reviews at the time of its release. I think there were, even, there were some comparisons to, to Sgt. Pepper's. Um, do you, you recall how you responded to those reviews at the time? Did it put pressure on you to, uh, to deliver the goods next time around? Uh, no, well, not really. It was, uh, what happened was after the first album, uh, Clive and Robin uh, kind of uh, said, well, that's it. We, we've, done, we've made our album. We're now off. And Clive went off to Afghanistan <laughs> and, and <laughs> India, and Robin went to Europe, to, went to Morocco. And so the band just folded completely, and Archie Fisher, who ran the, 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 uh, Crown, the Crown Bar uh, Foot Club, got me some gigs on my own. Around, uh, and so I did a tour around, uh, around Britain on my own with a kind of harmonica, right? Alan Dillon, and did his songs and, and some of my stuff, and did a kind of solo act thinking that they weren't going to come back, and they kept the rock band scoring. And then Robin came back after Clive, Clive disappeared into the, the depths of India. So Robin came back in about six months and, uh, and with all these instruments and fired with uh, a new enthusiasm for this kind of welding, uh, welding kind of Moroccan music and just world music in general into the Celtic kind of repertoire and also writing songs in that mode, you know. So he was the kind, he came back with all this energy and ideas, and meanwhile I'd written a few, some, a bunch of songs, and so we got together and played together, and it was really good. And then uh, Joel got us into the studio, and that was, um, that was uh, the Chelsea Sessions. Have you heard that? that? Yep. Mm. Yeah, that, that was us playing for Joel what we were thinking of making the next album of. So then at that point he kind of thought, well, this is really interesting. Let's take it away from folk and, you know, try and get them on a concert circuit, you know, and, and just make it a different thing. And he brought in different people to play with us, you know, like Dan Thompson. And, you know, he, he, he started then really molding us in a direction that he thought would give us a, a bigger canvas, put it mm -hmm. that way. In terms of instrumentation, you were very experimental in those days, a whole array of, of wonderful instruments that you used. Did you actively go out seeking a diverse range of sounds like that? Yeah, pretty much. It was more or less Robin. I was never really a multi-instrumentalist person, but Robin had it uh, right in his mentality. He wanted to create this kind of uh, kind of mix of instruments. And, and he had this idea that, um, that you didn't have to be a, a skillful player of an instrument to and to do something really original with it that was his kind of idea too mm. and he, he liked the idea of kind of just like using all different sounds to make a kind of canvas of things you know a network of of sounds and things so that was kind of interesting but he, he was definitely the i was i was more guitar kind of guitar obsessed because the guitar and electric too uh, guitar is obsessed and a little bit plonking at keyboards you know and a bit of harmonica, but, but I was more guitar and, and and he was more multi-instrumentalist. Yeah. I read a quote the other day describing uh, your working relationship with Robin as uh, one where you developed a robust dislike for one another. Would you agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, definitely not. No. No. <laughs> no, that's not right. So that, that, that's I think a bit... there, was a certain, there was a certain kind of rivalry in that we didn't want... Uh, either of us to get the bulk of a song to an album. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's about as far as it went. Because how, how we worked in the early days, uh, once Clive had left, 
Yes, I would write a song and I'd just go around uh, to Robin's place or he'd come to mine and we'd sit and work on it together and I, and he would um, do all the embellishments to the song that I brought to him and then he would bring a song to me and I would try to do the same but I couldn't, didn't really have the scope which is why I started doing the sitar to, you know, to add a bit to his stuff because he was doing so much for mine that I felt like I could only do harmonica, keyboard and guitar really and so uh, I, I started doing sitar and that, and that worked really well with his kind of output it fitted the kind of the songs that he was doing. So, Just, so that's how we worked. So, so no, we worked uh, very much in harmony. We, you know, we, we lived together a lot of the time. We went and uh, lived near Glasgow in a, a cottage with some people there and, and uh, just worked on the material. And so, no, we had a really good uh, working relationship. But we, we, we tried to not get to the point where uh, one of us had more songs on the album, but I would say that was the, that was the peak <laughs> of the rivalry. <laughs> so well, with both of you being you know, two you know, strong creative forces, uh, was there a particular procedure you went through in, this, in the selection process for, for uh, which songs to put on the records? Uh, no, that would be down to Kill. He, oh, he would okay. to, we, we'd prepare all, these, you know, prepare all the songs and he would say, well, let's try these. And, uh, and those were the days when um, he, he, he had a, an arrangement with studios because he was just feeling his way there. And he had, um, had an arrangement whereby he would do commercial projects and then if he didn't use the time, he would kind of bank up hours and so, uh, in the studio. So it, it was very, to start off with the first album we did, was really it was just a one day job around standing around a microphone. But then by the second one he'd built himself up, he was doing fair book convention and moving into that whole kind of thing. And so uh, he had a relationship with the studios and we worked in sound technique and, and we had loads of time to do the second one, you know, to do uh, overdubs of different instruments and Robin could do all these, you know, build up sounds and things. So um and so and he kinda of, he, I think we did uh, we did slightly more than the tracks we needed but not much he can, we, we could tell pretty quickly which ones were going to work and then we spent time doing them so you, you're still in contact with robin yes yeah, very much yeah. he lives in cardiff now but we, we talk we talk a lot mostly about uh about people wanting to put out uh, albums you know of old material or oh, yeah, where yeah. are the royalties uh, <laughs> where, where are the publishing royalties from America this year. Why have we not got a check yet? So that's, <laughs> that, that's the basis of our of our conversation. But we talk a lot. Right. So the the, the door isn't closed on you ever working together again? Oh, not at all. No, no. But he's he's very established again. You know, he's established in Cardiff, and and he uh, he has a a double act he does with his wife, uh, Bina, who who is um, been married for some time, and he does he does solo uh, a solo. I do that tour with John Renborn every year, which is very popular. And that's a really good act. I've seen that a couple of times. Yeah. They do, a, and and they've been doing that now for maybe five years. So they built up an audience, and that's uh, that's kind of a, a a decent chunk of his year. And then he then he, he tours really a lot on his own and with Bina. You know, so he's kind of established a, a a kind of different career, if you like. Now, you first played at America with the string band in, in 1968. Do you recall the, the initial response of American audiences to, to your music? Well, the first time we played was, uh, I think, was the, the, maybe the Philadelphia Festival, was it? Or maybe Newport. Was, the first thing we did was to Joe Augusto was to do a couple of festivals. I think it was the Newport Folk Festival was pretty early, the year after Dylan's Electric thing. Ah, yes. But we could have done one... Uh, maybe the uh, maybe be, maybe something before that Philadelphia or something. I've got a vague idea that that wasn't the first festival we did, but um, that was where we started. And then um, then we started doing a couple of things for WBAI in uh, in New York, uh, kind of uh, radio subscription radio station, and uh, they they kind of uh, adopted us a bit, and we did a, a charity concert for them. Uh, for Bill Graham in New York, and then that kind of uh, we kind of moved from there, really. And uh, we we uh, but we, we started off with festivals, and then we continued. We got onto the concert scene quite quickly. And of course, one festival you did play at was Woodstock. Although not many people would realise that because you, you're not in the movie. I believe there were some serious uh, weather issues that uh, turned your whole Woodstock <laughs> experience right, upside yeah. down. That, that's uh, that's described also in Joe's book. He's got he's got a whole thing about that. 
But um, yes, that's what it was. It, what it was really, we, I didn't really, we didn't really know Robin or I either until we read the book, George book, that he didn't really like the girls at all. We always thought he quite liked them, which shows how dumb they were, really. But he, he saw them as an element that was, uh, that was uh, watering down uh, the, the thing that we did together. Yeah. And he didn't really like, he didn't want them to, to, to he, he liked the string band before they joined, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so when it got to, to Woodstock, uh, we we had worked all our material for the four of us, you know, from from me and Robin and Licky and Rose, and he and that that was important to us because they were part of the band and we didn't want to kind of sideline them, you know. But when it rained on the Friday, and because of that, we had quite an electric setup, you know. They played electric. Rose played bass and Licky played uh, electric keyboard and that kind of stuff, and we couldn't just go up there and do stuff acoustically, or they would have had nothing to do really. Mm. And it was pouring rain, and so we couldn't do the electric thing. So Joe was trying to persuade us just to go on the two of us, and that was the time when everyone who did go on on their own, uh, uh, like Melanie and uh, the, the whole the whole kind of repertoire of people who performed that night, all be- all sold a lot of records and became quite famous. <laughs> and so Joe always made a point that we sh- we should have gone on and left the girls in the tent, yeah. <laughs> and then we would have been more. But it was, you know, it, it, life doesn't work like that. No, that's right. So that's yeah. just a dual theory, I think. <laughs> and then by the time we got back, the, the next to do our set, the next afternoon, uh, it, 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 canned heat had been on. <laughs> Everyone had had spent a night in, in, in total mud in their tents with no, no food and lots of kind of low-quality drugs. So by the time the next day came, all we really wanted was to boogie to canned heat. Yeah, and we came on after that, and we didn't really go too well. <laughs> a lot of people seem to to link the Incredible String Band with that whole uh, hippie culture movement. Uh, did, did you feel a part of that uh, movement? Oh, very much. Yeah, absolutely. Right in there. When we went, when we first went to uh, went to San Francisco, it would be I think 1968. It, it was just it's like going to another country. Everyone was playing bongos in the park, and there were coffee shops everywhere, and you know, it was just a, just a corner of paradise, really. And so we really, you know, we, we grasped that with both hands. We could see the, the entire capitalist monetary system uh, dissolving into barter. barter. <laughs> and, uh, so we could see the whole thing move, culturally moving on. Yeah. And so, so, yeah, we really, we jumped into it, really. And then the next time we went to California, went to San Francisco, it was kind of a ghetto. <laughs> Within about a year and a half, it had just completely gone, gone, gone feral. <laughs> <laughs> when you started recording your, your own solo material, did you uh, have a clear plan of, of the musical direction you wanted to take? Were you conscious of uh, distinguishing it from, from the, the work that people associated with you before? Uh, no, no, that's very much a dual thing. But what happened with we did uh, we did we Tam the big huge, which was a quite an epic, and Joe saw that as a you know that's a monumental achievement really, a double album, and it took quite a lot, and Joe was involved a lot in that. And then after that, uh, I took a holiday um, up in um, Russian River. I had some friends up there, and uh, so I went up there and I wrote a bunch of songs. And Robert, I'm not sure where Robert went, uh, maybe maybe over to Ireland, but we took a, a chunk of holiday after all that thing. And um, I, I came back to to Britain and and said to Joel, L- listen, I've written all these songs, and I'd really, do you think we could do another album? And he said, well, he said, well, I've just got this double one out. I mean, really, the, the, let me hear the songs. So he listened to him and he said, well, I mean, I, I don't know if that really fits to the string band, but why don't we... We craft an album because I know a lot of people really like your songs, and I could make a few phone calls and see if we could get different people to do uh, to play on each song. Like I'm sure some of the songs would appeal to different people. So I thought, oh, that sounds a great idea. So that's how it came about. He just got got on the phone from his diary of contacts because he had a lot of contacts then, because uh, as well as doing Fairport and a lot of bands that people respected, he was involved with. Um, uh, UFO, the, um, like an underground club in yeah. London, which where the Floyd play, everyone kind of played there, you know. And he was kind of running it with another couple of people, so he knew everyone. 
So he just formed a lot of people from Jimmy Page to um, to Pete Townsend, and to all these kind of contacts, and uh, and so quite a few of them took on the project uh, to to come and and do a track, you know, which was great. It's so really, it's, really he crafted the, the the people who played on each or suggested the people to play on each track. It's an amazing roll call of musicians on, on that record. And it's probably one of the great uh, forgotten classic albums of the era, I think. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yes, I think it's an amazing album. It's really good. Now, you weren't really uh, high profile during the 80s. There was an extensive period of time where we didn't hear much from you. What, what was keeping you busy during that period? Um, yeah, not very much. I, mean, I, wrote a few, I wrote some stuff for Manfred Mann. You know, it was Manfred Mann's Earth Band at that time, I and mean, he did... But three or four of my songs, three three of my songs then, and then the fourth one a bit later on. That uh, that uh, they were either written specifically for him or he picked up off off albums I'd done. And uh, I wrote for a few other people, Bonnie Tyler, and you know, just come and uh, and what I did do I did um, I did a lot of demos. I was paid by publishing companies to write songs, mm -hmm. so I just wrote a lot of songs, and eventually. Um, uh, a friend of mine who I, who we worked with on the demos a lot, Frank Usher, who who now plays with our band uh, Fish. It's, it's probably a different one from I think it's a different Fish in America, but he's from the British Fish. <laughs> he used to be Mar used to be the singer in Marillion. I don't know if you know that. Oh kind yes, of, yes, yeah, I remember. It's that. kind of a heavy rock kind of uh, genre. But he still lives uh, j just a few houses away from me in the same uh, row of houses in the country. He's, he's just. Uh, He's on the same rule, so he's there just now. He's got, he's got, got a break from uh, from fish gigs. But anyway, the two of us uh, read some couple of things in the papers about uh, Hugh Murphy, who produced uh, Jerry Rafferty. Yeah. Familiar with Jerry Rafferty's output? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, he, he was the producer who uh, worked with him. On, he did Baker Street, and he did all this stuff afterwards. And... He, it, well, after Baker Street, he got kind of completely downused by all the record companies wanting him to make star, you know, make international stars of the people on their roster, you know, from everyone you could think of, you know. And he was just fed up with it. And, and he, in this article that uh, that Frank and I read in, I don't know, if it, it was maybe um, NME or one of these magazines, um, Melody Maker maybe, he was complaining that um, that what he really wanted to do was hear somebody doing something original and somebody who had a roster of songs that he could really breathe upon. So Frank said, why don't you get in touch? So I did, and we, and we met for a pint in London, Hugh and I, and he said, that's really great. Hey, why don't we try and get a deal and make an album together? So we did, and we did it on Casablanca label, which unfortunately collapsed uh, in a couple of months after we'd done it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it's an interesting album. Now, and you, it's got all the, it's got, uh, uh, you know, Hugh Murphy kind of studio, everything, but the kitchen sink sounds, it's really very dated, because yeah. it sounds a bit like, Baker, you know, it's a, a very big production numbers, but the songs are very good, and um, uh, that came out, and, and that's, that's, that was what, what I was doing, that, that was 79, that would be, 79, it's probably released in yeah. 82 or something like that. Now you um, reunited with Robin in the in the nineties and started working with, with him again. Were you uh, do you recall being tentative or hesitant about whether you could recapture the, the feel of what, what you once had? Yes, definitely. I think he was too. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it, how it started was that Clive wasn't getting any kind of work, and he'd, he'd come he'd come back from India yeah. and he'd made a couple of albums that were very popular. You know, with the new folk movement. You know, because it was kind of they liked that kind of stuff. Uh, famous jug band and he, he a few albums that are quite, kind of quite prized by the people who find obscure albums <laughs> like, <laughs> like, the, like Vashti's kind of stuff you know, same yeah. kind of thing yeah. same kind of thing so um uh, so robert felt sorry for him and, and wanted to do some stuff with him you know and so then uh, they, they did a, a, a they did an album together actually and then they did a bunch of gigs and small clubs and then somebody approached and said well if if Mike could join, we could then call it the Incredible String Band, which was, you know, Robert and I were not that keen on that. It was just a marketing thing, really. And it was the people who ran the, the big events 
uh, at New Year in Edinburgh, which is a huge thing, Hogmanay, when people come from everywhere, and they wanted to put on a concert, uh, not at Hogmanay, but the night before, and, and just get the people who were in town, you know, and, and actually, organized by Archie Fisher again, it's still around from the book days. Mm. And so um, we got people like Billy Connolly and various people came along. And Bert Jens played too. We got a load of people and they all came. We had it in that big, big church in Edinburgh. And that was like the main reunion concert, you know. But it was, it was kind of a weird thing, really. It, was, it came out of, uh, out of just, uh, just Clive, Clive playing with Robin again, you know, and, and to, to give Clive work, really, because he, he was broken living in, you know, and he, wasn't, he hadn't really, uh, he wasn't, although he'd made classic albums, he wasn't really in the public eye. Yeah. So it came out of that, and uh, it, it wasn't really that rewarding because it, well, it, the people really wanted, um, they, they wanted string that stuff, and what they got really was the stuff that got us together, the kind of stuff off the first album, and the stuff that united us as a, as a trio, if you like, mm. but not the string band repertoire. So I think everyone was kind of dissatisfied really mm. <laughs> with it. But, but Jans played beautifully and uh, Billy Connolly did a funny spot and I, I guess it was, uh, I think it was a frustrating concert for everyone really, for us and the audience. You know? And out of that we resolved to kind of do slightly more string band stuff. And so we limped along doing that for a few years and then Robin didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't really something that was rewarding to him. He doesn't really like retracing his steps much. Yeah. And so he kind of backed out, and we carried on a little bit without him, but there was no point, really, because you can't really, couldn't really call it the string band if it didn't have both of us in it. That's true. So uh, so that kind of petered out. Now, you've worked with another Robin in, in recent times, Robin Hitchcock. Couldn't you tell us yes, how, how, yes, exactly. <laughs> how did that association come about? Well, it came about because uh, Joe organised a kind of string band tribute concert in the Barbican in London a couple of years ago. He tried to get me and Robin to play together, but Robin wouldn't do it. And so it ended up with uh, all these people coming, and he got really unusual people. He had a bit like the sale of them. He got really unusual people to come along. One, and actually, Robin Hitchcock was the musical director, which was a very good idea. He's very good at that. He's very kind of light touch, and, you know, he runs things like he's having a party in his house, really. It's a very kind of relaxed approach, and it worked really, really well. And uh, and Joe suggested all the people really, and then then there was a kind of song grab, and the people, the people who were slightly more famous got the first pick, like Richard Thompson got painting box, which I would have liked. He mm. said jealously, but <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way these things work. You know? And it was a really nice concert, and we met a lot of people that we've kept in touch, and we've kept in touch with uh, with Robin. Who, who keeps kind of employing me and my daughter and the guys I play with now to do various concerts. I've done, we've done three or four for him now. That's right, your daughter. So that's good. So we made a lot of contact. And we also made uh, a really good contact with uh, a Glasgow band called the Trembling Bells that Joe had approached. Have you come across them? I uh, heard of them, yeah. Trembling Bells, yeah. They got, that was Joe's idea. We listened to the records and said, no, I'd, I don't think we can collaborate with them. It's, uh, they sound a bit different to us. And then when we met them, they were so charming and delightful. And they're now really good friends of ours. And uh, the, the singer, Freddie, is really, they're all really, really nice. And we get on great with them. And that was through Joel that we met them, really. And uh, also Strangely Strain, who would know them uh, in the 60s, they, they came along and did stuff. And it was a really great mixture of uh, people playing. It was a really good concert. And, uh, yeah, so that was how that worked out. So you, your daughter, Georgia, is also a musician. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, uh, she is, yeah. She, she, uh, we brought her up in the borders here, where, where I'm phoning from, in fact. But then she went to a uh, university in Newcastle and uh, con continued on doing that, doing a, a postgraduate kind of uh, course in piano playing. So she's kind of a classical pianist, really. But... Um, so she plays with me, and we use the guitarist out of Trendy Bells when he's not kind of, he's kind of uh, busy just now because they're, they're touring with uh, Bonnie Prince Billy. Doing a, they've done an album together, a combined Bonnie Prince Billy and, and uh, Trendy Bells. So they're touring that just now. So we can't really get him at the moment. But he plays acoustic guitar with me and uh, electric guitar with them. So it's a, it's a, a four piece. It's a, me and Georgia and. Uh, and Mike plays uh, acoustic guitar, and then we use a, a fiddle player who's really good. 
So that's the kind of four piece that we do when we do get work. <laughs> <laughs> and just finally, before I let you go, Mike, is, upcoming plans, anything on the on the horizon recording wise, P possibly we could be hearing from you? Uh, not at the moment. No, we're, just, we're kind of, um, we're stuck a bit by not being able to tour when the Tundra Bells are touring, which is a bit of a problem, really. But we're not in that much of a demand, then, are we? <laughs> so the people are not beating down the doors to get us to play, so it's not really, we don't have any festivals or anything. They probably have a few this summer. So uh, we just do odds and ends. The, the last thing we did in London was really quite interesting. It's a guy, you, you might have come across him, a guy called Cass McComb. Have you come across him? Uh, no, Cass, I have, no. Mm, he's, he's kind of very cool. He, he's kind of... Uh, He's very cleverly built up his profile. Uh, if if you if you internet him, you know, if you you you'll see lots of videos and stuff. He's he's, he's kind of managed to build his career by being a kind of uh, San Francisco kind of vagrant who escapes from people. So that's his PR, you know. But actually, <laughs> actually, they're a really nice young band. But he he came to see a gig of ours in London uh, a year ago, maybe, and and then his 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 guys got in touch and said would you like to come and open for them on a couple of gigs? And the second of the gigs uh, was a place called the Union Chapel in London, which is a great venue. It's a very, very prized venue. It's like a huge, it's like a cathedral, really, like a huge kind of uh, cathedral. And it's, uh, but but it's it's actually a working church, you know, but it closes, it does concerts in the evening, and it's very, very high standard, you know, lighting and sound, and it's just very prestigious. So we said, okay, <laughs> I have no idea why he'd asked us really to do it. And then we did the two gigs and we still had no idea. Because <laughs> <laughs> the music is very kind of different music to anything that we relate to, you know. It's, it's very hard to describe. It's like kind of um, stoned out kind of Jackson Brown with uh, with a little bit of Steely Dan mixed oh, in. okay. And they're very kind of young, young cool kind of uh, San, San Francisco type guys. And I think... You, that they, a lot of people like the records. The band he toured with actually was very kind of uh, a, bit, a bit slightly jazzy, too jazzy for some people. Three of the people in the band had met at Barclay during a jazz course. So obviously they were really good musicians, but uh, apparently the, the, I don't know the records that well, but the records are not that jazzy really. And uh, I, I know a few people over here are, are kind of uh, very keen on this stuff. Oh, I'll, I'll be sure to check it out. Yeah, I think you might really like it. Hey Mike, back from me, <laughs> hey Mike, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute okay, honour. Okay, you're welcome. It was really nice chatting to you. It's been an honour to catch up with you. And um, we've got a fantastic festival season down here in the uh, first quarter of the, each year. So uh, maybe you can uh, put the put the word out and we can possibly get you down here. We'd love to see you down here performing for us. That would be very good. It's a long time since I've been to Canada. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks again, Michael. Yeah. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye.